from West Virginia Public Broadcasting. Support for the legislature today is provided by the following. The West Virginia Higher Education Policy Commission, working with students and families to improve college access and student success for a better West Virginia. West Virginia University, online at wvu.edu. Good evening, I'm Andrea Lanham, and this is the Legislature Today from the Capitol Building in Charleston. Capitol Security estimates 2,000 teachers poured into the Capitol today, the first of a two-day teacher's work stoppage. Russ Barber captured the mood of several gathering here first thing this morning. Hello, my name is Rhonda Wood. I teach at Cabell Alternative School in Cabell County. I became a teacher because a teacher made a difference to me. She reined in my unbridled spirit and she captured that motivation in me in first grade. Her name was Donna Griffith in Huntington, West Virginia. I have a thirst for knowledge and I have a thirst to transport that to my students. But without support and respect, that challenge becomes greater and greater every day. And that is what teachers are asking for, is the respect and support we deserve. My name is Danielle Harris and I've been teaching in Fayette County for seven years. Like most teachers, it's about my students. It's about being able to see them engaged in their learning. It's about making a change in their life. Sometimes we don't even see the change immediately. It's not until years later that they come back and they say, Miss Harris, oh my gosh, I just graduated from college and you were my favorite teacher and I really appreciate what you did for me. Sometimes teachers do things outside of the classroom that can change someone's life that no one sees, no one knows about. And it's those things that we have a heart for, that I have a heart for. So hopefully this isn't a hindrance. We want our parents to know that we support them. We want our kids to know that we love them. And this is for them too. Hello, I'm Stephen Justice from Logan High School. I have five degrees and working on my dissertation in psychology now for a PhD. And I have to work three jobs in order to survive and I guarantee you, I'm better off than a lot of these other teachers out here because my things are paid for, my truck is paid for, my house is paid for. What about all these other teachers that have uh, extra bills that, that I don't have? All 55 county school systems were closed today because of the two-day work stoppage over teacher salaries and PEIA costs. House Minority Leader Tim Miley and Delegate Ron Walters will join us in just a few minutes. But first, senior reporter Dave Mistich breaks down all the issues for us with the very latest. The first day of the planned two-day walkout comes just a day after Governor Jim Justice signed Senate Bill 267, which calls for a 2% increase this year for teachers, service personnel, and state police. The bill also includes an additional 1% pay increase for teachers in each of the following two fiscal years. School service personnel and state police will get an additional 1% next fiscal year. However, the final version of Senate Bill 267 called for less than versions passed earlier by both the House and Senate. These had called for variations of a 5% increase. Sam Burnett, an art teacher at Morgantown High School and president of the Monongalia County Chapter of the American Federation of Teachers, West Virginia, says the signing of the bill couldn't stop the two-day work stoppage. It was like throwing gas upon a flame. I mean, originally it was 1% over five years. They've cut it back to two. Now it all equals out over four, uh, three years, 4%. So basically they took away the promise of, of the five, which we were all saying all along that that isn't enough anyway. So basically I think it's a slap in the face to, I don't know how many people are here, but every employee in West Virginia. Other educators like Rachel Allender of Beale Elementary in Mason County say affordable health care is just as much of a problem as salaries. I go to work every day and hang out with 17 young people who may or may not be bringing all kinds of stuff and I need to stay healthy so I don't get them sick, so I don't bring sickness home and you know, my stu I depend on my students to come to school and I expect that of them and they should be able to expect that of me for me to be healthy and strong and you know, to be taken care of, especially if 
you know, I want to teach for the next 50 years. Democrats, particularly those in the House, have been loudly calling for a fix to the Public Employees Insurance Agency. While the PEIA Finance Board agreed this week to freeze once proposed increases to the plan, questions remain about long-term solutions. With what teachers see as a minimal increase in pay and PEIA's long-term stability up in the air, Delegate Isaac Spinagle says what lawmakers have accomplished this session still isn't enough. I've compared it to handing out Christmas hams. We're giving them nothing. We are not listening. And you see the result of it in the background. Uh, their insurance, we haven't made it a priority. We haven't made pay a priority. But we want to cut taxes and continue to cut taxes for businesses. We want to continue to give money out to uh, commerce and build courts that we don't need rather than take care of the people. So their priorities out of whack, and I think you're seeing the people have an uprising saying enough's enough. Republicans, though, say the legislature has to live within its means. While the state's economic outlook has brightened since last year, the majority party says the future is uncertain. As for the teacher walkout amongst all the goings on at the state house, well, House Finance Chair Eric Nelson says the legislature is listening and doing all they can. I just want to worry about the kids and everybody else. Uh, we've done as much fiscally as we can in this budget right now. You're damn right I'd like to do. We'd all like to do a lot more. But we've got to work within the body of what we have. And uh, we've, we've heard them. We've put a lot on the table very quickly in front of other things. And, um, you know, I guess everybody has a voice. But uh, there, there are many other people out there, too, that, uh, um, you know, we're all hurting in many ways. With the work stoppage continuing tomorrow, it is unknown what might happen after the weekend. Attorney General Patrick Morrissey has said his office is ready to assist state agencies and boards with a possible injunction that could send teachers back to work. But some lawmakers, like Senator Bob Beach, see the possibility of a long-term fix to PEIA not being accomplished before day 60 on March 10th. If I'm reading the tea leaves right now, I'm going to have to say no. I'm going to have to be a negative one. I don't think we're getting anywhere with the fixes to PEIA, and that's one of the bigger issues. Actually, it supersedes the pay raise. Uh, they want PEIA fixed. My family's with PEIA, and we see how it has just eroded the paycheck with all the increases over the last few years. PEI needs to be fixed before we leave session. But some long-term solutions to PEIA did make headway today. With teachers, service personnel, and other state employees lining the galleries and outside the chamber, House Bill 4625 passed on a 98 to 0 vote. The bill calls for the first 20 percent of general revenue surpluses, up to $75 million, to go towards the PEIA Stability Fund. The bill now heads to the Senate. For the Legislature Today, I'm Dave Mistich at the Capitol. Joining us now are House Minority Leader Tim Miley and Delegate Ron Walters of Kanawha County. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you. Thanks for having us. So as we've seen around the Capitol today, there's been about 2,000 teachers to come in here, and they've all mentioned concerns with PEIA and the teacher pay issue as well. What actions are they telling you that they would like you to take? I'll start with you, Delegate Miley. Well, I think their priority is PEIA, not just a short-term fix that's been done already this year, but they want a long-term solution because they see the likelihood of this happening year after year after year, and they got a taste of it earlier this year when they realized the potential changes that were made to PEIA. Thank goodness they were frozen, but unless something is done, they th believe those will be the changes they can expect to see happen year after year after year if we don't provide adequate funding for PEIA to make sure those don't happen. But that is their first and foremost concern. And then secondarily to that, although it's not any less important, is their pay issue. And one interesting thing to mention too, and we just heard them, is they're still here. Is there anything that surprised you, either one of you, about what they were wanting from you? Delegate well, Walters? I mean, obviously they want PEI fixed. But when you start to ask questions about what do you mean fixed, you get a lot of different answers. We've committed that over the next year, we put together a working group to work with teachers, to work with school personnel, to work with public employees, to work each side of the aisle, and bring all the stakeholders together to define what they mean by a fix and what they want us to work with and how they want us to do, do this. 
And there's different definitions, too, when it comes to what it means for PEI to be fully funded. Can you elaborate on that, Delegate Walters? Yeah, I mean, I've asked a number of people, and we even have differences inside of our, our caucus, and I'm sure their members have difference inside their caucus. Some people want 100% coverage at a, and no premium. Well, and some people say, no, I like the coverage the way it is, but we don't any premium increase. So we really, ne really need to narrow this down and talk about it. And this year we've, we've done a temporary fix. Uh, that's agreeable. Healthcare is kind of like a balloon. You squeeze it on one side, pops out the other. So if we're gonna work over on a long-term basis, we gotta structurally design a program that will be satisfied f for a long time to come. Delgat Miley, what's your opinion on fixing PEIA? We know that they need about 50 to $60 million per year to keep up. Is that correct? E yes, that's what we've been told by Ted Cheatham, who's the executive director of PEIA. And I can tell you what, what I believe is a fully funding fix to PEIA and what I've been told by the public employees that I've spoken with. And that is they want to make sure their benefits aren't being eroded and their premiums aren't going up. Because if either happens, they're getting less at the end of the year if their salaries don't also go up commensurate with the additional costs. So they want to begin with no additional premium increases and no additional um, benefit reductions. Now, if that happens, because health care does go up every year, at the very least, they want to see their, their compensation packages increase accordingly because they, what they don't want to have happen at the end of the year to be effectively making less than what they were the year before because they now have to pay more for health care. Now, one thing that did happen last night was the governor signed the teacher pay raise bill, and that was a, a bill providing pay raises for teachers, school service personnel, and state police. And some teachers called it, when I talked to them about this today, they called it a slap in the face because they said that the versions that they'd seen up until now was 5% compared to 4%. I mean, is there anything that could be done about that? At this point, the bill's passed and signed by the governor. And certainly, we've spent what we felt we could spend. We had to negotiate with the Senate. We had to try to hold our position. And in those arrangements, you have to give and take a little bit. Uh, it's not enough for teachers. I mean, we all admit that. We also are coming out of three years of budget deficits, where we were really scrambling, trying to, fill, to take care of our budget. We were cutting things. We weren't raising taxes. So with all that combined, we've come out of, out of that a little bit. The economy's starting to get better. We see some small growth this year, and we're applying, we had a $76 million surplus, and we're applying about $70 million towards these issues. Delegate Miley, what's your reaction? Well, I think the problem all began in the State of the State address given by Governor Justice. You, if you heard to hear him speak, the state was raining dollars from heaven because of what he accomplished over the last year. So much so that he once wanted to give business tax cuts. Well, you can't say one thing and then on the other hand tell the teachers, sorry, we can't afford to give you sufficient uh, salary increases. You can't say one thing and do another. And the problem is when you make those statements in the state of the state, that the state's doing so great, which those of us who are on the inside know that it's not doing as great as the governor would have you believe. But when you say that, and in the same breath talk about business tax cuts, the teachers and public employees are going to say, show us the money because we've been waiting for three years now for pay raises. And when it doesn't come, they get angry. And you're seeing that here today. Now, Delegate Walters, there's been some interpretation that this work stoppage is illegal, but of course there is a difference between a strike and a work stoppage as well. What happens if this does go on? Well, if it goes on, certainly, you know, they have the right to, go, to not go to work. And they're not, unfortunately, they're not compensated when, and they'll have to make up the time when they do return to work, and the students will be in school longer. It's an unfortunate situation. And I think cooler heads will prevail. It's just a matter of time and talking with them, trying to work with them. And I think in the long run, teachers want to teach. We want to try to do the best we can. And we do not plan to move any of those business tax cuts this year. Delegate Miley, how do you think this is going to play out? 
I think you will see a work stoppage for today as you saw and tomorrow. And I think Monday you'll see the beginning of rolling walkouts from various counties. I understand it's going to be five counties at a time to keep this at the forefront of the public's mind as well as the forefront of the minds of the governor and the senators and the delegates. Now, how it plays out in terms of whether it will make a difference, I don't know. But if it doesn't, I think they'll still be angry come election time and those who they don't believe are making a good enough effort to, to give them the money and the benefits they think they deserve, and they do indeed deserve them, they'll make a change come election. Now with PEIA, the House passed out the, the bill that would dedicate $29 million from the Rainy Day Fund to PEIA. But as we've heard, the Senate isn't exactly the biggest fan of this proposal. So where does that money come from, Delegate Walters? Well, certainly there are different pots of money that we're taking a look at. Where does the $29 million come from to, if the supplemental does not pass? Well, we, the other day we pulled back $12.5 million that we were taking out of general revenue for highways with the passage of the bond. That certainly freed up that $12.5 million. We also have a, a, a payment that's scheduled to go into the uh, workers' compensation fund we're going to try to withhold that back for one more year because we're within $29 million of fully funding that. And um, that's where some of this money will come from. And there, there are other bills out there that also have revenue generation opportunities. You know, we have a bill coming that has some funding for PEI in the future. It's not today, but it's in the future. And I should also mention that today the House did pass a bill that would dedicate 20% of the surplus until PEIA, the, the stability fund, reaches a $75 million limit. Now, Delegate Miley, you made an amendment to that saying that this bill could have been better and that would have dedicated 100% of that surplus to the stability fund. Tell me the rationale behind this amendment and why you thought that that would make that better. Well, the rationale behind the amendment of pouring 100% of any surplus we have into the PEI Stability Fund was a recognition of what level of priority we should make funding PEIA, not just this year, but into the future. Now, some people might ask, well, how is that fiscally responsible to take 100% 100 of a surplus and pour it into that stability fund? Well, keep in mind, it has to be a surplus, which means everything else that you need to fund in state government has been funded. You wouldn't get to a surplus otherwise. And the problem is, had we done this, passed this bill two years ago, with the $76 million surplus that Delegate Walters mentioned, we would have the $75 million in there. At a rate of 20%, we'll never get there because we have annual needs of between, as you mentioned earlier, 50 to $60 million. We could have a $100 million surplus every year and still only have $20 million poured into the PEI Stability Fund, and we'd still be 30 to $40 million short. Well, unfortunately, we are out of time, so that's going to have to be the last word. Delegate Ron Walters and thank House you. Minority Leader Tim Miley, thank you for being Thanks here. Thanks for having us. And here's just a short look at some of the passionate debate in the House today before the unanimous passage of House Bill 4625. We as a legislature have a duty to not keep decreasing the amount that we pay our employees by increasing their PEIA health costs. We have a duty to let, if there is a pay increase, to let it be a real pay increase and let them keep it in their pocket. Now, we lost that opportunity last night. Now, please understand that if we have a bonus, big, huge year, then we could see a greater amount than $5 million per year. There's been a lot of misinformation on this. But since we got down here day one, but we've done nothing but work on these issues to make sure that our state workers were taken care of. And while it would be nice if there would be one bill to put all this together at one time, the fact of the matter is we can't. That's why we've passed multiple bills that have funding sources for PEIA. That's why we passed this year a one-time funding because we work on an annual budget and we have to do that. We're looking to the future. We're trying our best to take care of the state workers. And I would encourage everyone here to vote for this. This is not a funding stream, right? This is a funding creek, and the creek is dry.
This is a funding mechanism and it's elegant and the chairman is to be commended for it. And in fact, if the chairman had done this three years ago, we would have fully funded PEIA. Not fake fully funded, but fully funded PEIA this year. Because 100% of the surplus over the last three years is $58 million. We had an opportunity last night to do that, to be 100% all in. This is a one buck problem and we're throwing two dimes at it. And we're probably only gonna have a nickel. It doesn't get us there. It doesn't get us there, and we will be back here in less than a year with the same set of problems all over again, like we were last year and the year before that. It is a balancing act in putting together the budget. Sometimes I wish I weren't upstairs, especially in times where this state has been knocked to its knees. 150 million tons of coal mined a few years ago, down to 80 million tons in 2016. We've creeped back to 92 million tons. The, the severance tax from that helps to fund our budget. We have struggled and struggled mightily, both Democrats and Republicans. I oppose the amendment to dedicate 100% of any surplus just to PEIA. There are a multitude of needs in this state. 20%, some will say it's not enough. I say it's a beginning. In the Senate today, Senate Bill 626, a significant piece of legislation known as the Coal Bill passed unanimously, but the teachers' work stoppage and debate over an appropriate fix for PEIA couldn't help but take center stage there as well. I think everyone in this body cares about teachers and wants to do what's best for salaries. They're our friends and our neighbors and our relatives, and we all want to do what's best. But I thought that just a little bit of the research that I've done might be appropriate to share that today as we have a multitude of teachers here from all over the state of West Virginia, just to say that we do value their, their efforts with our teachers. They teach my kids at school. They do a fantastic job. Um, but, but let's study some of these issues. Going forward, I think we're going to be doing a lot of great things, not just for teachers, but other state employees and other citizens in West Virginia. So thank you, Mr. President. These hallways are packed, and they're packed with people that are struggling. These people don't want to not be in the classroom. They want to be in the classroom. Matter of fact, they've done everything in their power to make sure that the kids that are not in the classroom are still going to have food while they are not here. You know, we need to do what's right by these people. I don't care what anyone says concerning it's illegal, it's illegal. What's illegal is how we treat our working class. That's what's wrong with this state. And we need to start, we need to start looking past the faces of those that don't even belong in our state. They're not even from our state, but they make billions upon billions from our state. We need to look past them and start looking at the faces that are closest to us. And these faces are the ones that are in every one of your communities. Earlier this week, the Senate passed and the House passed a, uh, a pay increase bill that provided a pay increase for three categories of, of state employees. And those are teachers and, and school service personnel and state police. Today, 1,100 state troopers across the state of West Virginia reported for work. And as a result of that, Criminal investigations are being done. Our state interstates are being patrolled and being kept safe. They are testifying in court, working with prosecutors on criminal cases. The state crime lab is open. And so I'm very thankful for that, Mr. President. I'm very thankful that they have shown up for work today, that they are doing their duty. And these folks are here exercising, showing up for work here today, coming down here, traveling distances to be here on, on their job as a citizen of this state and of this country. So it's insulting to people to sit there and say, well, certain people didn't show up for work, but the troopers are out there showing up for work. Insulting to these folks. Now, I'm going to submit to you, Mr. President, last Friday and, and, and also for several days, this, this has been, we have not treated the folks of West Virginia well, the visitors. And actually, tell you the truth, I want to tell you we're visitors, because this is their house. This is their chamber. 
You know that? That will do it for our coverage this evening. Join me, senior reporter Dave Mistich, and other colleagues tomorrow for our reporters look back at the week and look ahead as we complete the sixth week of the 2018 legislative session. And here's one last look at teachers gathered here today. I'm Andrea Lanham for the legislature today. Thanks for joining us and have a great evening.